All right, today we are going to take a look at Excel Chapter 2. So if you would flip over in your textbook to the green section, and we're looking at formulas, functions, and formatting on page EX58. We're going to create a salary report for Olivia's art supply. So let's go and open up a blank Excel spreadsheet. And I'm going to zoom in. Again, you can zoom in the lower right hand corner. I'm going to zoom in. I really just need to have A through K visible on my screen just so you guys can see that just a little bit better. And we're going to just get right in and start typing. Olivia's art supply is our title. And this is her salary report. Just like last time, we're going to merge and center our title. So let's grab A1 through K1 and hit your little Merge and Center tool on the Home tab. And let's add some cell style to that called Title. Let's select A2 through K2, Merge and Center. And let's maybe make that a little bit larger in size. Let's increase the font size. Let's make that about 14. They have adjusted the color of that font too, so you can pick a different color there if you would like. All right, let's add our titles for our uh, columns in row three. You'll notice row three is a little bit wider. We have some columns that are a little bit longer titles, so we're going to have to stack our headings. So I want to show you a couple ways to do that. So we're okay in column A. Let's type in employee. And we'll go to B3 and type in email address. And let's best fit any of these that we need to as we're going like we did last chapter. We're going to keep track of our dependents. And then in D3, we're going to type in hours worked and then hit enter. Let's go ahead and best fit it. And then let's go back to hours worked. And on your home tab, there is a little tool called wrap text. And if you wrap text, I should have not best fit it. That was my problem. If I wrap text, that should give me a stacked heading. So I should not have had you best fit that because it was stretched out. So if the entry that you type in is too long, it will wrap it for you. Let's go to E3. Let's type in hourly pay rate. And this time it's a stacked heading, but it's three lines. So I want to show you another way to do that. We're going to type in hourly. And now hit this for me. Give me an alt enter. Pay, alt enter, rate. So a new line, same cell, alt enter is your keystroke. So we're going to make that row three a little bit wider by stacking some of those headings. So you can use that wrap text tool, or if you prefer to hit alt enter, from your keyboard, that will work for you. So let's best fit some of these. Get a little bit of data here that we can work with, and then we'll show you some little tips and tricks from this chapter that hopefully will be beneficial to you. All right, let's type our employees down column A. Um, they have their last name first, so we have Bennett, comma, Joanne. And I'm going to go ahead and best fit that, stretch that out just a little bit. Fred, comma, Michael. Emmanuel. Celine. On Teresa Mont Samuel Otterman A Rice, comma, James. And we have Villanova, Susan, and we have X 
S-I-A-L, not sure the pronunciation there, and then Juan, or John, June, not sure what it is. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong, not sure what that is. All right, and then we're going to type in our headings, totals, and get track of highest, lowest, and average. All right, let's take a second and save what we've got. We don't want to lose any of this. Go save that. I'm just going to save mine to my desktop like normal. Save yours to wherever you're saving it, your flash drive or a folder. I'm going to call this Olivia's Art Supply with my name on it. All right. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit more so I can see. There we go. All right, we're going to type in a couple of addresses here for their email. So jbennett at email.com. And then we have mfred at email.com. So we're supposed to be able to give Excel a couple examples, and then it should fill for us. It, we're going to illustrate to you a flash fill if I can get it to work. Sometimes I can get it to work and sometimes not, so we'll see. I'm going to go up to data and I'm going to choose flash fill and it's not liking it. It should pick up this uh, little pattern that I have going on. So I have the first initial and the last name and they're all going to have the same email address. So let me type in a few more examples here. Works for us fine. If not, we'll just type them in. All right, let's see if it'll work now. Nope, it doesn't like doesn't like my pattern. So either I have something spelled wrong, but we'll try flash fill here in a little bit. But the flash fill idea is like they talk to you in your chapter about what if you had a ton of phone numbers and you forgot to put parentheses around the area code or hyphens. If you would fix the first couple and then flash fill, it would fill them all for you automatically. So it looks for a little pattern and tries to follow the pattern. And hopefully it should be seeing that I'm choosing the first initial and last name over here at email.com. Try one more time. Doesn't like my pattern. And that may work just fine for you. It, it worked earlier when I used it. And then, of course, when I'm trying to record, it doesn't like it. So it's trying to fill that. But it's filling it with the wrong one. So it's recognizing the S from Samuel Mont earlier, but this should be Villanova. And maybe I just don't have something spelled right. Right. And those automatically turn to hyperlinks for us as soon as I hit the space bar. So they're ready to roll. Let's type in our independence and get some data here. We're not going to type all this in. We're going to get a bunch of formulas and functions going here in a second. Those happen to be centered. So if we want to go ahead and center those, control E would work for us. Still trying to flash fill for me. I should be able to center with a control E just like I did in Word. Hours of work, we're going to type those in. I notice some of those are highlighted. 
and um, we're going to take a look at setting up something called conditional setting. So they don't just randomly have those highlighted. Those are the people it looks like that have worked over 72 hours. And maybe if they work over that, then that's their overtime. Now, if it's hard for you to see these, it's kind of hard on that color. They have this over in your textbook on, I'll give you a page number here. If you wanted to flip over and take a look at the data on page 62, that's a little bit easier for you to see. It's kind of hard with that color. We're going to type in the hourly pay rate. And hopefully I'm getting these right. If I have typos, we'll fix those here in a bit. We'll be able to see if our totals are correct or incorrect. And then we're going to skip over to higher date. We're going to type in our dates over here. The rest of these in the middle, we are going to have formulas for and functions. So don't type those numbers in. We're going to type in a formula and use the fill handle. And it's going to make life a lot easier. So I'm going to type these dates in. These are the dates that these workers were hired. Even though I'm typing in two digits, it's popping over four digits. So we're going to format the date here in just a second. So it's nothing you're doing wrong. Do remember if you get the little hash um, marks, um, best fit that, stretch it out, and it should be fine. Just about to get that I typed in here, then we'll have something to work with. When we get this much typed in, let's save it. And notice this looked a little weird too. I didn't type anything different there. That's just that cell is formatted that way. So let's save it. And then let's format our dates. If we want to select K4 through K12, you can format a couple different You could right click and go to Format Cells. Format Cells is also located up on your Home tab, and you can go to Format Cells up here. And it should pick up that these are dates, so dates should be here in our list. And I just want, it looks like they've got two digits for the month, day, and year. So I'll go with that format. So it's easy to format and fix that up. All right, we are going to go to gross pay. So we're going to calculate um, Joanne's gross pay. And we're going to take a look at our federal tax, state tax, and tax percentages. Before we get too deep into formulas, I do want you to take a look at page 66 in your textbook and talk to you for a couple minutes about how Excel handles formulas. At some point in your life, you have heard of the order of operations, and that is something you probably learned back when you took some algebra classes. But just to think about this, that is how Excel is going to handle a formula. So if I'm trying to write a formula and get a certain number, I need to think about, do I want parentheses around this part if I have a mixed operation going on? So moving from left to right in a formula, the order of operation, you're always going to look at negation and then percentages, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. So if you've heard that uh, as please excuse my dear Aunt Sally or PEMDAS, that is what Excel handles in that order, so the order of operation. So Parentheses are always looked at first. So the P stands for percentages first. 
in PEMDAS. Okay, so our gross pay, let's take a look. They have the formulas for you on page two, or I'm sorry, on page EX59. There is a typo there. So I think it's better if you maybe flip over and take a look at page 65 for our gross pay. So our gross pay, we're gonna hit our equal sign telling Excel, here comes our formula. We're gonna take our hours worked, which is D4. You can type in D4 or you can click on it using point mode times, when you multiply, you use your asterisks times hourly pay rate, which is E4. So D4 times E4, I can see my formula in the cell as well as on the formula bar. It's color coded. I'm gonna hit enter. I get a calculation. Let's check it. Are you getting 1268.94? If so, we'll fill handle that all the way down. Hopefully so. If your decimal places are off, um, if you go up to the number group, there's a couple tools that you can increase or decrease your decimal places. So let's say I didn't have any decimal places and I wanted to add a couple. I can click that. Or if I had too many and I needed to decrease that, we want to end up with two decimal places since we're working with money. So we'll get our first formula in and then fill handle that all the way down, please. Let's go to federal tax and for federal tax. We're going to take a look at our formula. We're going to take equal sign. Again, telling Excel, here comes my formula. I'm going to take 0.22 times, use your little asterisk, parentheses. So I have a mixed operation here. So I want to handle my parentheses information first. I'm going to take gross pay, which is F4, minus dependence, which is C4, times matrix 24.32 parentheses. So you have mixed operations going on here. If you don't have parentheses in here in the right location, you are probably going to get the incorrect dollar amount here. And hopefully we're getting 268.47. Notice I need to adjust my decimal places. So I'm going to decrease my decimal places. So I just have two and then fill handle it all the way down. State tax. Take a look at state tax. Uh, we're going to hit equal sign, 0 0.04 times gross pay, which is F4. So it should be equal 0.04 times F4. Hopefully you're getting 50.76. Adjust your decimals if you need to and fill it. And then take a look at our tax. We're looking for a percentage here. So we're going to hit our equal sign, parenthesis. We're going to take our federal tax, which is G4, plus our state tax, which is H4, parenthesis, divided by gross pay. So your federal and state tax divided by gross pay, hopefully you're getting something like 0.25157. Let's format that for a percent. So again, you're on it. It's selected. I'm going to go up to number. There's a little percent sign right here. When you adjust it to a percent, it always rounds it up. And in this example, they want us to have it two decimal places. So let's increase your decimal two spots. So hopefully it's 25.16 and we'll fill it. And I'm going to have you drag that even down one extra. It's going to show an error for a minute, but as soon as we get some totals over here, it'll fix itself and be fine. Let's go net pay. For net pay, we are going to write our last formula here. We're going to take our equal sign. We're going to take gross pay minus parenthesis, our federal tax plus our state tax. So nice that it's color coded. You can see the cells that are involved here. You can see your formula inside the cell as well up as on the formula bar, both spots. And let's check our total. Are you getting 949.71? And we'll fill it. All right, let's take a second and save. And then we're going to grab you some totals. They would like us to total up a few of our columns. It doesn't look like we're going to total up everything, but let's total up our hours worked. So we'll just use auto sum like we did last chapter. 620.75. 
We're going to take a look at gross pay. Let's auto sum. Are you getting 488.98? Let's go ahead and take a look at federal tax and see if our total is correct. Are you getting 268872? I know this, this is fixing itself after we've got some totals there that it can work with. And then we'll auto sum our state tax. Are you getting 499.56? And our pay, this will be our test. Let's see if we have typos. 9370 cents. So we've got our totals here. All right, we are ready to move down and take a look at highest, lowest, and average. We're going to look at some functions there. So we are going to go to dependents. So if I can get you to move to C14, we would like to know on average for our highest and lowest, we want to know our number of dependents. So I would like to know out of all my workers, what's the highest amount? So I can just glance there and I can see that it's three. But if I worked at a place that had hundreds of workers, this is when this calculation tool might come in handy. So we're going to show you a few different ways to write some formulas. Um, one way is just to go straight to AutoSum. And we've just been using AutoSum to add, but AutoSum also has a drop down. And if you click on the drop down, there are some features here. And the feature that we're looking for is max. That stands for maximum. So you're going to use max for highest. And it tries to look above. It's trying to look at the correct range. It's not quite everything that we need. We need to not include C13. So if we can look at C4 through C12, that's the range that we want to look at. So equal max C4 to C12. The word max is our and that C4 to C12, we've been calling that a range, but in this chapter they start talking to you as this is called the argument. And we'll hit enter and hopefully it pops up as three. All right, we can fill handle that clear cross. Let's go down to lowest. And we could use AutoSum here as well, but I want to show you a few other places that you can find some of these um, features. And we have not even looked at the Formulas tab. And all of these tools are up here in the formula, Formulas tab in the Function Library. So uh, you can go to AutoSum here, and here's a minimum for lowest. You could go to More Functions. And there are literally thousands of functions. And if you weren't sure um, the function that you, you're looking for, you can type a brief little description here of what you're looking for. Let's see if it can locate it. So I typed in minimum. Let's go back again. And hopefully, min or minimum would pop up in our list here. So lowest gives me, doesn't give me minimum. Let's type in minimum and see what I get. There's lots to pick and choose from. There's min, and then you can OK it. And it's going to want to know where you want to start and stop. So it's asking again for that argument, that new terminology. What's your argument? And my, my argument again is C4 through C. And my minimum amount is zero. And you can fill that clear across. And finally, let's go to average. Let's show you one more place. So I think the easiest is just to use auto sum min, max, and average, they're all right there. But some people like the formulas tab. So when you go to the formulas tab, you have categories. So if you're in a trig class, you might go straight to math and trig. If you're in a finance class, you might go straight to the finance group. If you use these tools a lot, you might go to recently used. Average happens to be sitting there, so I can use that tool. But I want to show you something else here. Do you see this little FX? That FX is sitting right here also, and if you click on that, That'll take you right over to the function library, too. And you have all these categories that you can pick and choose from. So I'm going to find average. It's going to ask you for your argument. 
Again, it's C4 to C12. So there's lots of uh, places that you can pick and choose to um, find those functions. So we'll fill that clear across. All right, I'm going to show you uh, a little bit on conditional formatting, and then we'll format and fix this up. So we talked about in our hours worked that some of those employees have, have highlighted hours worked, and those were the people that, that have worked the most for us. And I know you can go get the fill handle and you can just fill in that color very easily, but if I ha had hundreds or thousands of workers and I'm creating the salary report, it would be kind of nice if Excel would do that for me. So if you can select the range D4 through D12, I'm highlighting all of my workers. I'm going to go up to my Home tab. I'm going to come over to Styles, and there's a tool called Conditional Formatting. And I want to set up my own rule. And I want to format cells that contain the largest number. So I'm going to look for a rule up at the top. Format only cells that contain. If my cell value is, looks like greater than, and they're above 70, they're all above 72, so I could type in 72. If my cell value is greater than 72, I'm going to pay you overtime, so I want to be able to see that. I need to calculate that. So I want to fill it with a special color, and if you want to go look for a certain color, you can. And then they have also adjusted the font. It's hard to tell. It looks like it's white. So let's go the font. Be really careful if you start playing with um, changing the font color to white. I might make it bold too. So if my cell value is greater than 72, this is the look that I should see in my cell. So conditional formatting went out, took a look at those cell values for us and gave us um, some highlights. So conditional formatting is a cool feature. You can use it for tons of stuff. Um, I use it in my grade book. If, if a student follow, falls below a 60%, I know that I kind of need to watch that student. I might need to turn in an early alert for them. I can you know, make that 60% be my little cutoff. For stats, if I want to see, for a sports team, I want to see who's got the best batting average or the best free throw percentage. I can use it for statistics. I could use it for inventory. If I fall below a certain number on the shelf, then I need to flag it and I need to order some more items. So you can use conditional formatting for a variety of things. So those are just a few things. All right, let's take a look at fixing this up just a bit. We're going to add some dollar signs to our top row. They have selected E4 through H4. And in the last chapter, we just went up and we added um, the little dollar sign uh, from your home tab. The fixed dollar sign prints in the far left of a cell, whether it's a dollar or a hundred thousand dollars. I'm gonna stretch this out so you can see that dollar sign is staying right there no matter what. So they have the fixed dollar sign on the first row. Let's go over here and grab net pay too. They also have the fixed dollar sign down in your totals. So let's grab some of our totals. But they have added a different type of dollar sign down in our highest, lowest, and average. So if you can select that range, Um, e14 through h16 hold down your control key and then pick up j14 through j16 this dollar sign if you look in your textbook is really close to the numbers so that's called a floating dollar sign and the floating dollar sign i go up to my number group and i look for the style called accounting no i don't currency there we have currency currency is the floating dollar sign so let's review that for a second. The accounting format is the one that's stuck up here on your ribbon. That gives you the fixed dollar sign. It's fixed. No matter how large or small the number is, it's going to be in the left, left side of the cell. The floating dollar sign, I have to float out and find it, and it is called currency. 
So they talked to you a little bit about fixed and floating dollar signs in Chapter 2. I'm going to take a look at adjusting the height and width of some columns and rows. We've tried to best fit things as we've been going. But let's go over here to highest. Let's go to row 14. Just like we've been best fitting by double clicking the grid line, you can also double click and adjust the height. Now these are stretched out exactly how we need them to be already. But if I wanted to make that highest a little bit larger, I can just pull that down here and adjust it here. You can also go over to Format. And you could adjust the column width or row height right here if you need to. So if you wanted to adjust a certain column, let's try to make column C maybe. Let's make it a little bit smaller. Can't make it much smaller. But see how you can see the width right there. So you could adjust these a little bit if you needed to. All right, let's select row three and let's go to cell styles and let's maybe, let's add heading four. I'm going to bold those a little bit, but I didn't really want a blue underline. I like a different color underline. So let's go over to font and look at your underline tool. And you have all sorts of different borders that you can pick and choose from, but you could adjust the color if you would like to here. So to me, it looks like they have a different color. So let's go down to line color, pick up a different color. And then you should be able to see your underline here. Kind of light and hard to see, perhaps. Let's go down to totals. Going to select your totals. Same idea. Go up to your border tool, go down to line color, pick a color. And this time our style is a little different. We're going to get a bottom top and double bottom border, top and double bottom border, and that should give you a colored border right here. All right, it's getting formatted and fixed up. Let's look at themes. Let's go up and select the entire spreadsheet. So if you remember from chapter one, you hit that select all tool in the corner, go to page layout, and our theme tool is right here. There's lots of themes to pick and choose from, and as you scan over those, that's going to change the color scheme of your document. That might change your font face as well. And I think that they have selected something called Ion. Ion. You can pick whatever you would like, but it looks like that's what they've selected. Let's add a little color. Grab a little fill color for rows one and two. Pick a color of your choice. And we are going to take a look at a range finder. Let's go over to net pay. Let's select J4. In your chapter, they talk to you about a range finder. And a range finder is nothing more than just double clicking a cell and you can see one formula at a time. The color coding kind of shows you where you get the formula. If I hit escape, it takes me right back to my number. Now check this out. I want you to go up to formulas. And there's a tool called Show Formulas, and you can show all of your formulas. So when you guys submit homework to me, I want to know that you didn't just type in the numbers. I know you can type it, but I'm going to go in and be looking at your formulas. And you might print your formulas, or I can preview those on your screen. Sometimes that's helpful if you're looking at somebody else's work, too. You're not sure exactly where they got their data, and you might want to hit Show Formulas. The shortcut key for that is if you hit your Control key, and the little tilde symbol or the left apostrophe, it's the key just to the left of your one on your keyboard. If you hit that back and forth, that will toggle and take you back between formulas and actual data. Now, I want to stay on that paper just a second, and I want you to take a look at the tool called Trace Dependence and Trace Precedence. 
So a precedent means it came ahead of time or preceding. So when I hit trace precedents, I should be able to see that I needed gross pay, federal tax, and state tax in order to write my formula or my calculation to come out correctly for net pay. Can you see those little blue dots? And then trace dependents. I'm depending on this number being correct or I'm going to have some issues down the road here. So this is just part of auditing. We wrote the, the spreadsheet. We know where we got the data, but if you ever need to look at somebody else's data, that auditing kind of helps you look and see where they got some things. And that's nothing that we're going to print. We can just remove those arrows, but that's just kind of handy when you're looking at somebody else's work, just kind of evaluating and, and looking to see where the data was gathered. Okay, I want to take a look at one more thing, I believe. Let's go to page layout. And in page layout, there's tons of stuff inside page setup. And I just think it's the handiest thing if you go to page setup and hit your little page setup tool, that little um, arrow in the corner, hold your gallery button. If you click that to open it up, you can decide if you want to set up lots of things inside page setup. You know, sometimes when you're printing, it works fine portrait, but it looks a little bit better if you print landscape. This tool for scaling, this is the best thing. If you are not sure if it's going to fit to a page exactly or if part of it's going to be cut off, I always just get in the habit of always just selecting fit to one page. So I don't have to worry about adjusting margins. Excel will shrink it and make it fit to the page no matter what. So if you would always go in and make sure that's selected, life's going to be easier for you. Go to margins. I don't have to worry about my margins. We just talked about it. I selected fit to a page, but under margins, if you wanted to center your document horizontally and vertically, the tools right here that you can select, that's kind of handy. And if we go to header footer, you can quickly add a custom header and a custom footer. And using the header and footer here inside a page setup is so much easier than trying to insert it through the insert tab. So let's go custom header. Let's type your name in. Let's type in Excel project two. And then we're going to type in Olivia's art supply. Okay, so you can kind of see a preview on what it's going to look like. This is what it's going to look like. Same thing with your custom footer. If you go custom footer, you have a left, center, and a right section. So if I wanted to maybe stick in a page number, go to this intersection, maybe click on my date, go to the right section, and stick in my time, I can kind of see what this is going to look like. So I can see it in the preview. And then if you go to the sheet tab, there's here, do you want to print um, pure black and white? You want it to print row and column headings? You want to see the, the gray grid lines all over the place? You've got those options here that you can turn on. They are turned off by default. Now let's just hit print preview so you can see what it looks like. That is what it would look like if I would print that out and see that is fitting to one page. Half of it's not on another page and it's nice for me to see everything in one location. So that is a little run through of page layout. Of course, you want to make sure that you spell check your document. Um, the only thing that we had trouble getting to work was that flash fill. And you might try that for you. I think that it'll work for you after you give it a couple examples. I think I just had a little issue with one of my examples. So hopefully that'll work for you. You are going to work on submitting this to get your 10 points for creating that with me. And then at the end of chapter two, you're going to uh, work on a couple documents. Again, like always, um, create all your documents, save those, go to the Dropbox, browse, and add all of your files before you hit submit, and that will get you through Chapter 2. Uh, let's save that. Um, contact me if you need help with anything. Good luck as you work through Excel.